Okay. Thank you for joining us and uh, thank you to our esteemed guests. Our panel today is on consensus building in the Federation and for federalism. And we, uh, I think all of us will appreciate how absolutely critical a topic like this is. Uh, we've had before this some problems with, uh, you know, people confirming we have some technological problems. So we may have people kind of joining us uh, midway and uh, that should be fine, but we'll start till then. We have uh, uh, an excellent lineup specifically with regard to the topic, the best people we could have had. Uh, we have uh, uh, Afrasiab Katak Sahab with us, and we have Esan Iqbal Sahab with us. Um, and uh, not that they need much of an introduction, but Esan Iqbal Sahab is a member of the National Assembly of Pakistan and is serving as Secretary General to the Pakistan Muslim League N. He has served as the Minister for Interior the Minister for Planning, Development and Reforms, as well as Minister for Minorities. Uh, Afrasiab Khatak Saab is, of course, as we know, a politician and intellectual, a Pakhtun rights activist. Um, from uh, Khaybar Pakhtunkhwa, he has been elected as provincial president of the ANP and has been elected as a senator from the uh, KP Assembly in 2009 and has um, um, remained with the ANP. Joining us later will be Sanaula Baloch Saab, who is a member of Balochistan Provincial Assembly. He's a former senator and a member of the Pakistan National Assembly. Uh, he's affiliated with BNP, the Baloch National, uh, Balochistan National Party, and serves as a senior constitutional advisor to the UNDP. Uh, we also will be having with us um, um, uh, Senator Mushtaq Ahmed Khan, a member of the Senate, as a candidate of uh, Jamaat Islami Pakistan from Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. He has served with the party as a provincial uh, a general secretary as well as, uh, as uh, Naib Amir. Uh, Shafkat Mahmood Saab will try to make time. He may join us midway uh, because he's currently in another meeting. Uh, he's the current Federal Minister for Education and Professional Training and Federal Minister for National History and Literary Heritage. He is a member of the Pakistan Tehri uh, Kensa. So thank you all of us for joining us. We really appreciate the time you've taken to be here. Um, we'll start with... Um, Afrasiab Khatak Saab, if I may, and um, for some reason my screen is not increased. Anyway, uh, so Afrasiab Khatak Saab, if I can first start with you. Uh, before that, we do know that uh, just just to a quick note on on the importance of of um, consensus building in in a diverse uh, federation such as Pakistan. We know that the crisis of federalism has has kind of created crises in the past. Um, it stalled the constituent assembly for about a decade, which is why we couldn't have a constitution for a large part of our history. Um, it also led to the dis dismemberment of the country and the independence of now what is Bangladesh. It's also entrenched historic grievance narratives between different communities and has created real material terms for, for uh, grievances. Uh, but we have seen the Pakistani democratic process evolve to a point that it was able to address these issues um, in, in a substantial way through the 18th Amendment. We've had some um, in terms of, uh, so if I separate process and content, in terms of content, you know, there are things that we see our democratic polity has, has come together for parting, uh, for across party lines for issues, for instance, on, on legislation on women's rights, for example, where you have cross party voting, but more substantially, we'll be talking about today, the process of consensus building. And we do have to, uh, examples, uh, uh, most critically the 18th Amendment, which, which was a, a, a milestone and pivotal to democratic governance in Pakistan and uh, resolved very many long-standing issues. And it was a process that was not hurried and we're very lucky to have the architects of that process with us. And then we see a similar process that was replicated later for, for FATA reforms where, you know, um, and there was voting, uh, there was people came across through different party lines, as well as we had, uh, you know, engagement with citizens and soliciting opinions from people. We saw that happen also in the 18th Amendment. So with that, 
just like really quick roundup, I'll, I'll start with Afrasiab Khatak Saab and ask him as, as one of the, uh, the primary you know, architects of the 18th Amendment to talk us through the process about, you know, it was a decision to not have a new constitution to amend the existing one. And to be able to do that through a highly consultative process uh, um, without media controversies, you know, it was done in camera, it was lauded across the political spectrum, passed with unanimity. So Afrasiab Saab, can you come in on that and explain to us how, how something like this was possible? Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this uh, webinar uh, to give us an opportunity to talk about a very important uh, issue of our uh, national political life. Uh, building on what you have already said, I would like to uh, start with, the, uh, with explaining the fact that the polarization which is attributed to the debate over federalism in Pakistan uh, is really uh, not a correct uh, perspective. Actually, uh, the polarization has been between uh, democratic forces and anti-democratic forces. By anti-democratic forces, I mean the particularly the uh, civil military uh, bureaucracy, which has been uh, opposed to a federal democratic uh, parliamentary system in the country. Uh, political elites or political class has proved uh, at least at two major occasions that they are uh, uh, not only ready, but they are capable of uh, reaching uh, to an understanding and create a consensus, broad consensus, over the uh, federal democratic uh, framework of the country's uh, constitution and uh, political system. Uh, and these two are, uh, one was in 1973, uh, when diverse political force has got together and shaped a constitution which, uh, which is federal democratic parliamentary, which is according to the vision of the uh, founders of the country. Uh, and unfortunately, this vision was not uh, really uh, uh, accepted or uh, internalized by previous uh, governments. But from 1973 onward, we saw, I mean, at least uh, uh, a consensus among all political forces from all provinces. Uh, and, and the second uh, occasion was uh, the uh, shaping of this 18th Amendment. Uh, in 2009, the process uh, started and we were able to complete it uh, up to 2010. Uh, there were 14 political uh, parties and parliamentary groups in the parliament. And there was not a single political party which remained outside uh, the process. Uh, it also included parliamentarians from FATA. So we were able to, uh, over many months, we were able to uh, uh, amend 102 articles of the constitution. Uh, one third of the constitution was uh, amended and uh, the uh, uh, amendments uh, regarding federal uh, system in the country was the most important part of this amendment. Uh, so I, I, I think uh, when it comes to uh, uh, democratic process, uh, I mean, the uh, political people are able to uh, create a consensus and 18th Amendment is a, is a proof that it was a win-win situation for both the Federation and the uh, federating units. For the Federation, of course, now uh, after 18th Amendment, if Khaber uh, uh, is not progressing, Khaber Pakhtunkhwa can't say that Islamabad is responsible for it. Or Quetta can't say uh, if Balochistan is not progressing, that Islamabad is responsible for it. it it's for the uh, provincial government. Uh, so so, so that, that in a way strengthens the federation. Uh, on the other hand, the provinces have resources now and they can really uh, uh, make a difference if they uh, really, uh, they have political will and they have the capacity and commitment. So I think it's, it's a very, very uh, important development in our political life. Uh, I, uh, those who are attacking this 18th Amendment, I think the, are the ones who represent this, those, that old anti-democratic school, which actually is uh, afraid of uh, further development on the path of a federal democratic system. Uh, and they're afraid of a system where uh, democracy will prevail. It will, it will be, uh, be strengthened, consolidated. And, and I think that that's the real uh, issue. So I, I, I think uh, the, the 18th Amendment has proved that uh, po politicians from uh, all the four provinces, including uh, Punjab, they, they were able to uh, agree on uh, certain uh, parameters, constitutional parameters. So uh, it, they, they, they sort of rejected the, uh, the assumption that uh, uh, political people from different provinces can't agree on the quantum of autonomy. Uh, 
we, we had debates we did, uh, and the 18th amendment was, is the best example of negotiated settlement for our country's uh, constitutional problems i wish we had uh, adopted this path in 1971 we could have avoided uh, the uh, tragic events in 1971 that led to the disintegration of the country thank you <clears throat> Thank you for that. That was uh, very specific to the point and that answered all, uh, you know, raised many other questions as well. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's interesting that uh, the 18th Amendment was not really very long ago, and, uh, but we have it kind of coming again, you know, into the spotlight and becoming contested yet again. But uh, we seem to have even, you know, as, as, as um, far away as a decade ago, been able to uh, move certain things along and we that we struggle with now, such as, you know, the ability to understand the difference between political opponents and political opposition on the one hand, and between challenging political legitimacy of opponents on the other. So as an Iqbal Saab, I would, I would request you to kindly come in on that and explain to us to kind of build on what Afrasiyab Khatak Saab has just spoken about. How do we understand the notions of compromise and negotiation as, as a pivot of, of democratic politics? What are, like, how do you oppose somebody without challenging their political legitimacy? What are, what are the kind of minimum rules that we need to have for political engagement? Um, you know, uh, so how, how do how, how do we move forward in a, a context where that seems to be increasingly difficult? S. Anigwal Saab, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Afra Saab Khartak Saab has given a very good uh, background uh, how 18th Amendment was done. And let me just briefly say uh, that one of the key uh, precursors of 18th Amendment was Charter of Democracy signed between Mr. Nawaz Sharif and Benazir Bhutto Saiba. What Charter of Democracy did that it developed a consensus among two major political parties on the future outlook of the future democratic outlook for the country. That how we need to revert back to the original constitution and how we need to turn Pakistan into a truly parliamentary federal democracy. Uh, so that Pakistan can uh, realize its uh, aspirations of people. Uh, and that laid, I think, a good solid foundation for uh, 18th Amendment to be uh, successfully uh, debated and passed. Uh, when the two major parties were actually uh, on one page, uh, there was not much of an issue because the smaller parties had already been demanding most of the things that we have agreed in the 18th Amendment. The problem in our country has been the discontinuity of democratic process because that uh, then uh, due to this discontinuity, the organic growth of consensus building, I think gets very negatively impacted. Uh, as far as the you know, consensus building within, within democratic uh, norms is concerned, well, one thing is very critical that there must be a shared understanding and a, a, a realization among all the players that while we compete for our respective market share in electoral politics, we must have the ability to collaborate to defend the industry share of democracy. Uh, you know, in uh, business, they normally say that in mature markets, players learn the art of playing both competition and collaboration game. And I'll give you one example. Uh, for example, in Cola's Pepsi, Cola and uh, Coca-Cola will be uh, uh, competing with each other on a cutthroat basis. But when it will come to defending the Cola market against some other beverage, they'll join hands. Similarly, uh, what we have seen in the past that sometimes the political players in Pakistan took their own rivalry to a limit where the space of democracy uh, got compromised. And I think the Charter of Democracy gave this new uh, understanding to the political players that while we compete, we must learn the ability to collaborate, to protect and strengthen the democratic foundations and the, the democratic space on which we all uh, play. 
Uh, and that I think enabled. Uh, and then there was this uh, understanding that we all have to accept each other as legitimate players in democracy. It is not um, either or. It is us. We all have to uh, come to some understanding if we want democracy to be healthy in this country. Uh, the problem with Pakistan has been, as Mr. Afrasiyab Patak has mentioned, that there is a constant pull by the civil and military bureaucracy to run the country on central authority. Whereas the DNA of Pakistan is very diverse. Uh, it has many, uh, you know, different uh, federating units. Unless we have federal structure and spirit, it cannot work smoothly and we have paid the price through separation of East Pakistan in the past but unfortunately still we have not learned the lesson. Uh, there is this urge on part of our uh, central institution which is military and bureaucracy that they want to control all political and financial resources of the country through central authority and that brings a tension within a smooth uh, functioning of the federal democratic uh, structure. Uh, I would I like to say that, you know, again, we are having a situation where some of the political players in the country are not willing to understand that the success of democracy lies not in absolute troops with one party. We all are part of that troops. Uh, government and opposition, uh, everyone is an integral part of any federal democratic uh, system. But when any one party begins to think that it is only us who represent the ultimate absolute truth and opposition or all other parties are traitors or they are uh, not sincere to democracy. It's either or us. That leads towards polarization. And that polarization starts to impact functioning of democracy, federal uh, federalism very adversely because where you have governments there which are not uh, your own government or, or there are opposition governments, federal government starts to uh, discriminate against them. And I would like to, you know, very proudly present few cases. For example, when we were in government, uh, there was PTI government in KP province. There was PPP government in Sindh province. Now, KP government had been denied idle profits uh, uh, by the central government for many decades. Despite the fact that PTI was our arch rival and they were protesting against it on streets, we gave KP government their due uh, share in idle profits. And we also co-opted them in CPAC uh, project, uh, which was done with consensus and chief minister of KP always admits uh, that at that time that, you know, the federal government never denied me my uh, right or uh, any opportunity. So we co-opted them in all the national projects, whether it was national action plan, whether it was CPAC, whether it was... Uh, any other major initiative. Similarly, in Sin, while there was People's Party, which was the arch rival party, we worked in collaboration with Sin and in third, where they had coal deposits bigger than Iran and Saudi Arabia's oil in energy value, they were lying dormant for 70 years because they could never arrange financing for them. Federal government through CPAC provided financing, worked with government of Sin as a partner, and as a result, today, that coal in Thar is now one of the cheapest sources for power generation in Pakistan and is an asset for the government of Sin and also government of Pakistan. So we work together and that shows the power of collaboration. But if you are highly polarized, then you lose this ability to collaborate. And I think it was this uh, uh, collaboration that helped us achieve 18th Amendment consensus also. Let me just in the final comments say that while we have been very lucky to get uh, uh, 18th Amendment passed, uh, which has removed all the martial law interventions or laws from Constitution and also restored federal structure uh, of the Constitution, to me, uh, while previously center was top heavy and there was a demand that uh, center must shed some weight towards provinces so that provinces have greater responsibility. After 18th Amendment, provinces have become top heavy now. 
And unfortunately, provinces have not done enough to shed some of their added responsibilities to the local governments. I think now the real challenge for Pakistan uh, is that how can we develop a good, viable local government structure uh, so that all the three tiers can work hand in hand for effective service delivery uh, to the citizen. And it is only through good service delivery that democracy can be strengthened. And that remains now a real challenge that while provinces have assumed a lot of responsibilities and resources, they have failed to delegate some of those functions and resources to the local governments at district level. And that I think now is a challenge we all need to uh, come up uh, with solutions and try to solve. Thank you for that. That was uh, an excellent summation and I uh, appreciate specifically you're bringing in the examples uh, to kind of uh, bring it at a material level what kind of issues have been resolved in the past. So it's not just the 18th Amendment, but how it cleared the way for whether it's distribution of Heidel profits or so on and so forth. And I think the critical thing to draw forward from S. N. Iqbal Saab's uh, um, uh, talk is to look at the importance of according legitimacy to political opponents, because if you delegitimize whoever is is opposing you, then that creates the kind of polarization we've seen increase in the in the present and making uh, you know taking democratic governance forward more and more difficult to do so. He's also signaled uh, something that I'd like to go back to Afrasiab Khatak Saab about, and that is the issue of local governments. So whereas we see that at one level. The, the kind of devolution of powers that have kind of emanated from the center towards, towards provinces, we see that it hasn't kind of burst further in, into effective local governments. We do now have fairly good local government laws in place. What we don't have is, um, is an effective I'm sorry, I don't really know what just happened, but it's back. Can I be heard? Yes. Now we can hear you. Okay, apologies for that. Um, so I'll, I'll just move over to Afrasiab uh, Khatak Saab about, about local governments, trying to understand what is it that creates a particular insecurity between otherwise strong provincial governments that are unable to pass on the kind of power that they would like to receive from the center, but are unable to disperse it further. Uh, we do know there is a background of kind of uh, a history of, of um, them being used by martial regimes. So we do understand some degree of skepticism, but now with politicians, elected politicians in the driving seat, we should be far more confident of this process. Um, Afrasiab Saab. Thank you very much. Yes, I agree with uh, Asan Iqbal Sahib. He's uh, absolutely right uh, to point out that uh, powers, unfortunately, have not been devolved to districts and uh, uh, union councils, local level governance, which is very important, and which, which was actually the real objective of the 18th Amendment was to devolve power to the people, to grassroots. And that has uh, yet to happen. So I agree with that. As far as why it has not happened, I mean, uh, first of all, unfortunately, our uh, elites uh, uh, at provincial level, particularly members of provincial assembly, uh, they think as if uh, devolving power would uh, deprive them of their powers uh, or their uh, control over resources. But, th but that is very uh, wrong notion because uh, ultimately, uh, the service delivery has to take place uh, at local level. And it's the local government that can really uh, do, do that. Uh, so, so, so that should be uh, borne in mind. The other thing is, unfortunately, again, we have seen some degree of uh, weakening of the democratic uh, process because of the recent uh, developments in the recent years. Uh, you see the, the, uh, the political parties uh, who, uh, give, who had given ownership to 18th Amendment and who were really uh, be, who really believed in devolution of power to provinces and onward to districts and subdivisions and union councils, 
uh, unfortunately, uh, were sort of pushed back and uh, uh, they, they, they were not able to uh, complete the work which they wanted to complete. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we have seen that uh, although uh, th there are political forces that uh, pretend to uh, be committed to uh, democracy, devolution, people's empowerment, but unfortunately when it comes to practice, uh, then, then we uh, see a reverse journey. Uh, so so that, that, that is a problem uh, in the recent uh, years and uh, months. The, uh, but I hope people of Pakistan will definitely overcome this uh, as they have done uh, in, in the past. And, and I think the, the commitment of uh, all major political parties, most of the major political parties remain to devolution. Uh, we, we, we should not only have strong local governments, but we should also have provincial finance commissions to, to uh, sort of divide uh, finances uh, among the districts and subdivisions. You see, unfortunately, uh, uh, so far the trend is that uh, the district from where the chief minister comes gets the most of the resources. <laughs> it's sort of monopolized, the, the type of monopolization that we see on provincial level can be seen uh, in intra-provincial competition uh, among districts. So I, I think we, we have to address these issues and I think it is the unfinished agenda of uh, 18th Amendment and federal democratic system. Thank you, Afrasyab Sahab. And I'll men I will acknowledge now, um, uh, Salam, Senator Mushtaq Sahab. Can we, we welcome you into our session? Thank you for joining us. Um, the point you've come in at, we've been talking about local governments, and we do know that you have also, uh, you know, strong opinions on the issue of devolution. And uh, like Afrasyab Sahab said, it's still an unfinished agenda. We seem to be in a position where you have cross or political commitment in terms of, you know, political party management manifestos, uh, in terms of the ideology itself, people seem to, uh, our political spectrum seems to agree that this is something that's critically required, but we don't seem to still be able to move forward. And for instance, like he said, you know, the Provincial Finance Commission. So we're not seeing the money move, we're seeing the rhetoric, but we're not seeing uh, any strategic move towards making it happen. So would you like to come in on that, uh, Senator? Sir, Senator Mushtaq Sir, Senator Mushtaq Sir, your mic is off. So your mic is off. If you can please unmute. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, you're unmuted now. We can hear you now. پولیٹیکل پارٹیز بدنام بھی ہیں اور بدنام بھی کیے جا رہے ہیں لیکن اس ملک میں اگر قومی یکجہتی سالمیت اور اس کے اتحاد و اتفاق کے لیے اگر کوئی بنیاد موجود ہے تو پاکستان کے سیاستدانوں نے اور پولیٹیکل پارٹیز نے فراہم کی ہے اور اس کا سب سے بڑا جو ثبوت ہے وہ انیس سو تہتر کا دستور ہے پھر اس کے بعد اٹھارہویں ترمیم کو دیکھ لیں پھر اس کے بعد پچیسویں آئینی ترمیم کو دیکھ لیں یہ ساری چیزیں ایسی ہیں کہ جو عوام کے امنگوں کا ترجمان ہے اور جس کی وجہ سے پاکستان کا جغرافیہ سالمیت اور پاکستان کی ایک چہتی وہ اس سے بہت اچھا ایک بہت اچھا حل ہم کرتا ہے لیکن وفاق جو ہیں وفاق کے اندر جب مختلف حکومتیں آئی ہیں تو خصوصاً موجودہ حکومت کی اگر میں بات کروں تو انہوں نے ان دستور کے اوپر جو 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 صوبوں کو حقوق دیتے ہیں پروونشل اٹانومی دیتے ہیں جو مالیاتی حقوق مشتاق صاحب 
I'm sure we'll be trying to get him back. Senator Iqbalta, uh, maybe we should talk actually, what is the internet politics of this country? We're supposed to have, you know, Senator uh, 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 Saab has dropped out right now. We can't hear him. Sanaula Baloch Saab is, is in Kharan and having internet problems over there. You know, in, in this day and age for us to still be struggling to get internet access, parts of Fatah and Balochistan don't have uh, internet in its entirety. So maybe that's a conversation we should be having that why is something so basic and so fundamental still so out of reach for us to get kind, some kind of tech stability. But Mushtaq Saab is back and we will have him back. G Mushtaq Saab, please carry on. Sir, you're mute again. If you can please unmute yourself, Senator Mushtaq. G, thank you. Please go on. Okay, now I don't know if he's there anymore. And no, Senator Saab, your mic is on mute. So if you can kindly unmute yourself, thank you. जी मुश्ताक साहब अब आपको अगर आवाज आ रही है आप बोलिए आप आप हैं लाइव हैं आपकी आवाज आनी चाहिए हमें अब जी 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 आ रही है आवाज आपको बिल्कुल आ रही है जी अच्छा अब मेरे इंटरनेट पे मुसलसल आ रहा है कि योर इंटरनेट कनेक्शन इज अनस्टेबल तो ये पूरा निदान है अनस्टेबल है अच्छा मैं ये अरस कर रहा था कि इसमें अगर आप देख लें कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन के अंदर आवाज आ रही है आपको जी आप अगर कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन के अंदर देखें उसमें आर्टिकल एनएफसी का 160 है 161 है एनएचपी का है फिर 158 है गैस के ऊपर प्रायोरिटी इस्तेमाल का हक है फिर 172 है जिसमें ओनर स्लेस लैंड का जो एक इख्तियार सुबों को दिया गया है और इसी तरह 140A है जिसमें लोकल गवर्नमेंट इलेक्शन है जिसमें फिजिकल है एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव है और पॉलिटिकल डिवोल्यूशन है ये सारी चीजें हमारी कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन के अंदर मौजूद हैं इसी तरह सी है काउंसिल ऑफ कॉमन इंटरेस्ट है काउंसिल ऑफ कॉमन इंटरेस्ट के अंदर भी जो मुश्तर इशूज हैं मुश्तर मसाइल हैं उसको हल किया जा सकता है ये सारे इंतजाम कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन के अंदर मौजूद हैं बदकिस्मती से इनके ऊपर अमल नहीं होता और जो गारंटी सूबों को इख्तियार की माली वसाइल की कुदरती दौलत पर इख्तियार की इसी तरह लोकल गवर्नमेंट निज़ाम की वो दी है दस्तूर ने वो वक्त हुकूमत वक्त और जो निज़ाम है वो उसकी वजह से मसाइल पैदा हो रहे हैं मैं समझता हूँ इन मसाइल का हल इस दस्तूर के ऊपर अमल है और दस्तूर के अंदर जो रास्ते दिखाए गए हैं अब आप देख लें वन फोर्टी जो है बल्दियाती इंतबात होनी चाहिए और इसमें नुमाइंदगी होनी चाहिए यूथ की और उसमें नुमाइंदगी होनी चाहिए किसानों की मजदूरों की खातन की और वो एक फिजिकल एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव और पॉलिटिकल डिवोल्यूशन होनी चाहिए लेकिन वो नहीं हो रहा हमारे खैबर पुख्तरफा हुकूमत ने इलेक्शन एक्ट जो है उसकी सत्रह दो के मुताबिक आर्टिकल सेवनटीन टू के मुताबिक आपको वन ट्वेंटी डेज में इलेक्शन बल्दियात के कराने होंगे जब बल्दियाती निज़ाम का वक्त पूरा हो जाए अगस्त में 2019 में खैबर पुख्तनख्वा के अंदर बल्दियाती निज़ाम का वक्त पूरा हो गया है उसूल इनको दिसंबर 2019 में ये इलेक्शन कराना चाहिए था लेकिन इन्होंने एक एक्ट पास किया सूबाई असम्बली से जिसका नाम है एपिडेमिक कंट्रोल एक्ट और उस एपिडेमिक कंट्रोल एक्ट के तहत इन्होंने माओराई दस्तूर अपने लिए दो साल की इस्तना ले ली बल्दियाती निज़ाम से अगस्त दो से अगस्त दो तक अब सूबाई असम्बली को यह अख्तियार कहाँ से आ गया कि वो दस्तूर से मावरा कानून साजी कर सके तो असल जो इशू है वो ये है कि जो एनएफसी का इशू है एनएचपी का आप देख लें अभी कल मैंने अखबार में पढ़ा है कि 450 अरब रुपए आईपीपी को देने के लिए वफाक ने मंजूरी दे दी आप आईपीपी को 450 अरब रुपए दे रहे हैं और खैबर पुख्तनख्वा जो इन्वायरमेंट फ्रेंडली और सस्ती बिजली आपको दे रहा है उसका पांच अरब रुपये आप नहीं दे रहे क्यों नहीं दे रहे आई को जब आप दे रहे हैं तो खैबर पुख्तनख्वा को अपना हिस्सा क्यों नहीं मिल रहा इसी तरह आप देख लें एन के अंदर एन में मुसलसल ये कोशिशें की जा रही हैं कि एन में जो सूबों का हिस्सा वो बढ़ने बल्कि वो कम हो जाए और उसके लेकिन बजट के अंदर कौमी वसाइल के अंदर उसके लिए हिस्सा जो है वो नहीं दे रहे तो असल जो मसला है 
वो हुक्मरानों के अंदर हैं हमारे दस्तूर के अंदर वो सारी चीजें मौजूद हैं अगर कोई कमी है तो मैं समझता हूँ हमारे पार्लियामेंट हमारे कौमी असम्बली हमारे सेनेट के अंदर मुमकिन है मसाइल को भी हल किया जा सके असल चीज अमल दरामद है जब आप अमल दरामद नहीं कर रहे तो उसके नतीजे में लोगों को इख्तियार नहीं मिलता लोगों को हकूक नहीं मिलते लोगों को अपनी मालियाती वसाइल के ऊपर हक नहीं मिलता उसकी वजह से तरक्की नहीं होती उसकी वजह से बेचैनी होती है इसतराब होता है बेतमीनानी होती है अनरेस्ट होता है और कौमी यकजहती मुल्क की तरक्की और अवामी फराव बहबूद ये सारी चीज़ें मुतासर होती है Thank you, thank you, Sanjeev. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll take those questions that you pose forward to S. N. Iqbal Sir. Abhi jaise Sir Prasi, Aap Sir Aapne kaha ke he just pointed out that we don't really have anyone to blame anymore. Like I mean, there is enough power that's vested at the provincial level uh, for provincial governments to proceed as they want. And if they aren't, I mean, how? What kind of questions does this raise if if it's still not happening? Um, and I think it maybe a lot of it comes down to the issue of political trust. And maybe this is a conversation. that we need to have you know both of you uh, the prior speakers have hinted at civil military tensions um what what kind of an environment can we create unless we have political trust and you know like how i mean strengthening the federation is one thing but it's also in terms of you know citizen and uh, state relationship um when you don't have that kind of political trust we've seen for instance conspiracy theories across pakistan even in the pandemic you know the government is saying one thing you know and no one's willing to even believe them people are still not sure Sure, if if you know the COVID nineteen even exists or not. So I mean, these are the kind of pathologies that result from not being able to or not being willing to trust the state and the official narrative, and it creates all kinds of you know uh, collective psychologies and and collective sociology sociological concerns for how we vote and how as we work as as an electorate. So Asan Iqbal, do you want to come in on what Mushtaq Sahab said and take forward the question of political trust? I think you know we must also understand that there is also a much broader global and wider crisis which democracy is undergoing. Uh, if you look at uh, United States of America, which is a much older and established democracy, uh, what has happened in recent years? The kind of polarization that was there under President Trump, uh, and how uh, these uh, sentiments were fueled. to uh, delegitimize opponents uh, similarly you look at our neighboring country india how prime minister modi and his party have used ideology and politics of identity uh, nationalism to delegitimize their opponents and create very a uh, high level of polarization in their country and similarly uh, i feel that in pakistan we have the same phenomena in some way so this is a much broader global i think phenomena and uh, democracies will uh, find a solution will uh, i think be able to resolve this and we have seen in america that uh, the democratic uh, forces the uh, uh, civil society they all joined hands and they are now on a correction course so this will happen eventually but but that certainly brings a toll on the system now coming to pakistan i think one issue is that uh, the uh, elite political elite in the provinces somehow it is enjoying the extra power it has inherited from the center so they don't want to give it up easily but the positive side is in the recent days uh, i have seen uh, that supreme court has taken notice that why effective local governments are not functioning in pakistan and there are two cases right now pending before supreme court uh, about local governments and i hope that you know that will also give some impetus uh, unfortunately in punjab we saw that uh, the government uh, in punjab province dismissed arbitrarily uh, local governments uh, and uh, removed more than 50000 elected officials from their offices and that created a big void and now my you know last point is that i think how we will see uh, that uh, this situation will change absence of effective local governments is bringing big pressure on governance structures our provinces are totally becoming unmanageable particularly the urban centers without if there is no solution for our cities without having effective local governments 
if you look at uh, even now small towns if you look at even in the villages uh, the lack of basic facilities the problems of municipal services uh, the problems of basic service delivery to a citizen it is becoming simply unmanageable from the province and i think there are this is a strong demand which we see is now being generated from grassroots uh, to uh, people now demand better service they want clean Uh, communities cleaner communities uh, there is no uh, arrangement for uh, uh, you know uh, uh, disposal of the waste and even in the villages uh, in small towns big cities are becoming dumps of waste now this all now is creating a very i think strong case for effective local governments and eventually very sure i think very soon we will see that the provinces will not be able to escape the uh, issue of uh, re- restoring effective local government structures in their province if they really are in the business of meeting the demands of their citizens thank you for that um i would actually have liked to talk about the council of common interests as an existing platform and as a, an immensely potent idea and how it's kind of diluted over time and now doesn't seem to be fairly functional but before i do that we have some questions that have been uh, coming in for uh, our panelists and i'm going to read those out uh, the question first one i have in front of me uh, from the audience who's viewing this is for um, afrasia khatak saab and asan iqbal saab the question is how comes student union still remain banned uh, is it it a violation of the fundamental rights under article 17 and the other is that uh, devolution and diversity the twin towers of federalism have only prospered when state power has been shocked and awed such as in 71 and in 2008 after the martyrdom of benazir bhutto is there a correlation of rasia saab and the question seems to be from murtza solangi specifically for you so if you'd like to answer that of rasia saab Ji, thank you very much. Uh, yes, these are very important questions. Uh, I, I think uh, in Pakistan we have uh, a lot of unfinished uh, business as far as democratization is concerned, political as well as social democratization. There's a, there is a lot to be done. There's so many problems waiting uh, to be solved. Uh, and let let me just point out that the uh, when we talk of federalism, uh, it's horizontal democracy. and you you can't have it without having vertical democracy i think th- these are very uh, closely interconnected uh, aspects of democratic system so i i, I think we we have had problems with the de- democratic process as uh, as adik balsab had earlier pointed out these disruptions uh, and ruptures uh, it, 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 so, it, so so many times have really blunted the process and really uh, have uh, Uh, turn the process into a retarded one uh, so th- that really explains the, the issue but i i, I think it's uh, when we uh, talk of uh, de- evolution and diversity prospering in democratic system it is understandable uh, as i earlier said i mean uh, uh, when the vertical democracy will get strengthened the horizontal democracy will follow uh because there there can't be a democracy without uh, recognizing uh, diversity in a country like pakistan and let me just uh, uh, very briefly refer to its impact on nation building and state building uh, project you, you see uh, democracy sounds messy and noisy on the surface but deep down it creates unity unity in diversity uh, and 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 when you recognize diversity it is strength It, diversity is not a weakness some some people unfortunately uh, view it it very negatively actually uh, democracy uh, in democracy diversity can be united by recognizing it by respecting it by celebrating it uh, but you see when you uh, negate it when you try to bulldoze when you try to have enforced uniformity as we have been uh, witnessing in our country enforced uniformity is the real problem And, and that has hindered the process of nation building and state building in this country states are strengthened when there is democratic uh, process uh, both vertical and horizontal uh, spheres w- which really uh, give ownership to the people people take ownership of the state policies which strengthens the states but unfortunately we we have tried to uh, uh, to to try the other one I mean, the colonial uh, system which we inherited was not based on uh, consent and consensus 
it, it was based on, uh, you see, bulldozing and f forcing people uh, to, to have state systems and uh, nations uh, which, were, we, which they uh, may or may not have liked. So, but I think we have to come to uh, a new uh, uh, strategy for uh, nation building state building, which federal democratic parliamentary system provides very well. And we have seen uh, in our uh, experience that uh, whenever we have democratic process, the country is more united. Uh, is stronger and it, 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 it is more divided when there is dictatorship, although on the face of it, it's, it may seem to be uh, very quiet, but this is the silence of a graveyard and I don't think we really can afford that. Thank you for that. Um, well, let's hope it's not the silence of the graveyard and it can be ruptured. And I think that, that there is a, a huge importance that maybe we, we think we need to think more critically about is the importance of dissents, dissent in any democratic society. Um, so let's let's hope we'll, we'll, we'll he start hearing the noise. The noise is already there. Uh, but I think you've, um, you know, as an Iqbal Sab had earlier spoken about the Charter of Democracy, for example. You spoke about colonial systems of governance and we've seemed to have uh, sustained one particular format of colonial uh, administration, and that is the APC, the All Parties Conference, which would logically be the parliament itself, except you know, the APC was done when the parliament was Westminster, it wasn't here. So we seem to also be able to draw strength from non-parliamentary forums where decision making and consensus building does happen. So, you know, what are these pathways? How does the parliament then, how do you have a parliamentary forum, which is where political parties and political representatives come together, and then you have these non-parliamentary parliamentary forums where the same similar kind of happening uh, dynamic plays out, but then at times they oppose each other, at times they, they kind of strengthen each other, and I'll ask Mushtaq Sahab to please come in on that. Uh, you know, what, what kind of, Mushtaq Sahab, if you can help us with this, what, what kind of commitment do we need to strengthen, not just, you know, I think there's a cross-board acceptance of the importance of democracy on, in Pakistan. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, we used to hear, does Pakistan even deserve a democracy? are we educated enough? We don't hear that anymore. I think there is an acceptance of the notion of democracy, but we don't seem to have a commitment to the institutions of democracy. Why doesn't that spillover happen? Mushtaq Sahib. Mushtaq Sahib, please go on. Your, your mic is not muted. We should hear you. Ji, Mushtaq Sahib. Uh. سب سے پہلے تو میں افراسی آپ خاٹک صاحب نے جو گفتگو کی ان کا شکریہ ادا کرتا ہوں ان کے تمام نکات سے مجھے اتفاق ہیں بہت اچھے نکات انہوں نے بیان کر دیے ہیں اصل میں اگر ہم جمہوریت کو مضبوط کرنا چاہتے ہیں تو اس کے لیے ہمیں ایک ملٹی پرانگ اسٹریٹجی کے ساتھ آگے بڑھنا ہوگا اور اس وقت تو ہماری جمہوریت کو سب سے بڑا خطرہ یہ ہے کہ ہماری جو ملٹری اسٹیبلشمنٹ ہے اس کا ایک لارج پولیٹیکل فٹ پرنٹ وہ ہماری سیاست کے اوپر موجود ہیں سب سے پہلی چیز تو یہ ہے کہ اس کو کسی طریقے سے شرنک کیا جائے اور جب تک اس کو شرنک نہیں کیا جائے گا آپ یہاں پہ جتنے بھی اقدامات اٹھا لیں جمہوریت کو اسٹرینتھن کرنے کے لیے اس کو استحکام دینے کے لیے وہ آپ کامیاب نہیں ہو سکتے تو سب سے بڑا مسئلہ جو ہماری جمہوریت کو پہلے دن سے ہے اور میں آپ کو یہ بتاؤں پاکستان کی ایک خاص آپ سے کہہ سکتے ہیں کہ نوعیت ہے کہ پاکستان ایک جمہوری پروسیس سے وجود میں آیا ہے پاکستان جمہوری پروسیس سے قائم رہے گا پاکستان جمہوری پروسیس سے ترقی کرے گا اس کے لیے قائم رہنے اس کی بقا اس کی ترقی کے لیے جمہوریت کے علاوہ اور کوئی راستہ نہیں ہے تو سب سے پہلی چیز تو یہ ہے اچھا یہ چیز ہم کیسے کریں گے اس چیز کو کرنے کے لیے کہ جب جمہوریت کو اسٹرینتھن کریں اس کے اثرات جو ہیں عوام تک پہنچائیں ہمیں دو تین چیزوں کرنی ہوں گی نمبر ایک پولیٹیکل پارٹیز بیسیکلی لوگوں کو تعلیم دینے کی شعور دینے کی حقوق کی آگاہی پیدا کرنے کی اور ملک کی ترقی کے لیے ایک بنیادی آپ سے کہہ سکتے ہیں پلیٹ فارم ہوتا ہے سیاسی جماعتوں کو اپنے طور پہ انٹرنل ڈیموکریسی کی طرف جانا ہوگا جب تک ہمارے سیاسی جماعتوں کے اندر انٹرنل ڈیموکریسی نہیں آئے گی اس وقت تک ان کی ان کے اندر قوت نہیں آئے گی ان کے اندر طاقت نہیں آئے گی ان کے اندر عوام ان کے اوپر عوام کا ٹرسٹ نہیں آئے گا تو سب سے پہلی چیز تو یہ ہے کہ انٹرنل ڈیموکریسی پولیٹیکل پارٹیز کو انٹرنل ڈیموکریسی کی طرف جانا ہوگا دوسری بات یہ ہے کہ جس طرح ہمارے دستور کے اندر ہم نے کچھ چیزیں رکھی ہیں 
جمہوریت کے حوالے سے پارلیمنٹرینس کے حوالے سے پارلیمنٹ پارلیمانی پروسیس کے حوالے سے اس طرح سیاسی جماعتوں کو بھی میرٹوکریسی کے اوپر آنا ہوگا پرفارمنس ڈیلیوری کی طرف آنا ہوگا ٹرانسپیرنسی کی طرف آنا ہوگا جب یہ چیزیں آئے گی عوام کا ٹرسٹ ان کے اوپر بڑھے گا اور اس کے نتیجے میں جب عوام کا ٹرسٹ ان کے اوپر بڑھے گا تو کوئی ڈیموکریسی کو تھریٹ نہیں ہوگا کوئی جو انکروچمنٹ کوئی ادارہ وہ کرنے کی ہمت نہیں کر سکے تو ایک چیز تو یہ دوسری بات یہ ہے کہ جو ہماری سیاسی جماعتیں ہیں ان کو آپس میں بھی یعنی یہ تو ایک سیاسی جماعت کے اندر کے ان کے آپس میں بھی کچھ چیزوں کے اوپر اتفاق ہونا چاہیے اگر سیاسی جماعتوں کو ایک کم سے کم آپ سے کہہ سکتے ہیں پولیٹیکل میگنا کارٹا آف پاکستان جس طرح سی او ڈی تھا چارٹر آف ڈیموکریسی تھی اسی طرح ایک پولیٹیکل میگنا کارٹا آف پاکستان ان کو کرنا پڑے گا آپس میں جس میں ایک چیز یہ ہوگی کہ ہم ڈیموکریسی کے اوپر کوئی کمپرومائز نہیں کریں آپس میں اختلاف اپنی جگہ آپس میں جتنی بھی دوریاں ہیں وہ اپنی جگہ لیکن اس کو ذریعہ نہیں بنائیں گے نان پولیٹیکل فورسز کو دھرانے کا تو ایک پولیٹیکل کنسنس پھر اسی طرح عوام کی یعنی جمہوریت وہ مضبوط ہوتی ہے جس کے ثمرات جس کے اثرات عوام تک پہنچے بدقسمتی سے ہماری جمہوریت کے اثرات اور ثمرات بوجود اس میں پولیٹیکل پارٹیز کا بھی پولیٹیکل لیڈرشپ کا بھی کمزوری ہوگی لیکن اور بھی بہت سے فیکٹرز ہیں بڑے بڑے فیکٹرز کچھ اور ہیں کہ یہاں پہ جمہوریت کو کام نہیں کرنے دیا گیا جمہوریت کو اختیار نہیں دی گئی اگر جمہوریت آئی بھی ہے تو ایک بے دستو پاور ایک ہائی برڈ ڈیموکریسی تھی ایک صحیح ڈیموکریسی نہیں تھی جس کی وجہ سے وہ پرفارمنس نہیں دے سکے تو ان کو کچھ پرفارمنس ڈیلیوری کی طرف جانا ہوگا جس میں ایجوکیشن ہے جس میں اکانومی ہے اور جس میں ٹرانسپیرنسی ہے یہ وہ چیزیں ہیں کہ جس کے نتیجے میں عوام کو آپ جمہوریت کے ثمرات جو ہیں جو اثرات ہیں جو فوائد ہیں وہ پہنچا سکتے ہیں تو میں سمجھتا ہوں کہ اسی طرح کی کچھ چیزوں کے اوپر پولیٹیکل پارٹیز کو کنسنس پیدا کرنا پڑے گا جس میں ان کے اپنے اندر کی ایشوز بھی ہیں اور جس میں ان کے آپس کے ایشوز بھی ہیں اور جس میں ان کے کلیکٹیولی جو ہماری اسٹیبلشمنٹ ہے ان کے ساتھ ڈیلنگ کا بھی ایشوز ہیں Thank you for that. Um, lots of questions have come in now from everybody else, but I know we don't have time. We're out of time. Um, uh, so uh, what I'll ask uh, uh, Senator uh, Esen Iqbal and Afrasi Aap to do is to, you know, just your last comments. If you want to reflect on the issue of internal democracy within parties, please do so. If you'd like to talk about, uh, uh, you know, the, the issue of consensus building, how do we go forward? Do we need a political Magna Carta, what Mushtaq Saab is calling, in terms of a new social contract, a new social political contract? Do we need to recognize and articulate the threats to democracy and yes. bring in I, what Aprasya Saab called anti-democratic forces on the table. What, wh- how are we seeing the way forward? Uh, Iqbal Saab. Yeah, I think uh, those are very valid observations. Uh, first of all, let me say uh, your previous question. I am my, myself a product of students' unions. I was president, elected president, engineering university students' union, and that actually gave me the training and uh, the platform which has enabled me to reach this far. And I believe it is a very useful uh, uh, platform for youth of this country to acquire political uh, training uh, and leadership training. So we fully support it. Now, you know, there are many, there are many questions that why our democracy is not growing like other democracies. I would just like to refer to Abraham Maslow's theory of hierarchy of needs, which he gave back in 1943, that human needs operate through a hierarchy of needs. First level are basic physiological needs, then security needs, then you have your group needs, then you have your recognition needs, and finally self-actualization. Now, in a democracy where your fundamental basic survival is not guaranteed, And democratic parties and democratic regimes are all the time struggling for their own security. We cannot expect higher level reforms or organic growth of democracy to take place. We have not been allowed to graduate from the primary section of democracy. You know, every time, every, every five, 10 years, uh, these uh, forces of establishment, uh, they come in and they roll back. And to me, I think, Their basic fear is that if democratic leadership and democratic uh, <coughs> process gets strengthened, it might uh, impact the civil-military relationship 
in the favor of civil leadership. So they want to keep politics and democracy at a certain threshold level, not go beyond that. And that is why we are all the time struggling. It has been 73 years. Uh, look at India, look at Bangladesh, look at other countries, how they have uh, grown organically. So the fundamental point is that somehow we have to tame this uh, uh, establishment to know that where, if they are interested in Pakistan's stability, they must understand and their limits. They cannot uh, cross those limits and uh, then see that Pakistan flourishes and becomes stable. Now, in this, I think Lahore Declaration passed by PDM uh, uh, is an, another historic document which has gone unnoticed. It is as important a document as Charter of Democracy where 10 democratic parties, I hope that Jamaat Islami will also sign it and they should read it and they should become co-signatories where all democratic parties have to, to, together promised to people of Pakistan that if given chance, they will uh, work in true democratic spirit. They will strengthen democratic institutions. They will strengthen rule of law. And above all, they will respect the personal human rights, fundamental liberties of citizens, as well as their economic rights. So they will empower people of Pakistan with good governance so that their economic rights and their fundamental rights are respected. So I think that's the landmark uh, declaration which all parties have signed. Thank you, uh, Esan Iqbal Sahib. That was a fantastic summation. I never thought of putting a political party on the Maslow's hierarchy, but I think you've drawn probably a, 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 the critical underline uh, we need to uh, place before all, all kind of analyses on the health of Pakistan's democracy is is to look at the spurt it's been allowed to kind of grow and, and not being able to kind of move up the ladder and organically evolve to a point that it takes on the bigger picture questions and it's always in a struggle for survival. So point well noted and thank you, sir, for that. Uh, Afra Siyab Sahab, we have about um, two minutes. So whatever thoughts you would like to leave us with, uh, please do. Thank you. Uh, I agree with what uh, Senator Mushtaq Sahib said and what uh, Senator Iqbal Sahib said. Uh, I, I would make very quick two points. The first point that I want to make is that unfortunately we have, uh, apart from having a de jure system based on the constitution, we have a de facto system which really clashes with the de jure and unfortunately doesn't let the de jure uh, to function and progress and have an organic uh, progress. So that, that is a major challenge for political parties and democratic forces in this country, which is a must, I mean, we, 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 which is a very important a part, uh, Without doing uh, away with it, we can't really uh, go ahead uh, in a smooth fashion uh, to have developments. I mean, I, I'm referring to what uh, Senek Balsa was saying. I totally agree with, with, with him. Secondly, I, I also want to say that uh, in a country like Pakistan, we, uh, we have to respect our constitution. Uh, constitution is important for every state because the grown norm. Uh, no state can function without a grown norm. But for Pakistan, it is very important because it's a new country. It's not China, it's not Persia. Uh, it, it, it is not a 2,000, 3,000 years old state. It is a recently created state, so it really uh, need that. And in the end, I would li li like to uh, address our youth, our young people, and would tell them that they wow. shouldn't lose hope. I think we, we should struggle, and they, they should really uh, have confidence in the people of Pakistan and in a, in a just system based on federal democratic uh, state system. And uh, they, they should keep on struggling for that, and uh, I, I would like to end with uh, a couplet from uh, an English poet uh, who said, Oh God, give me the dreams of the night so that I may escape the nightmares of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Uh, nice poetic touch. And if I could kind of bring in a distorted line of poetry of my own. 
uh, well, not my own poetry, I meant Yeats, but if we distort it a little, you know, things fall apart that the center tries to hold. So, uh, you know, do excuse uh, uh, that. Um, so I think we're important, ending on an important point uh, of uh, reaching out to youth and highlighting that it is a young country. Uh, you know, 70 years might might be significant in the stretch of human life, but it really not is not in the health of nations. Uh, uh, so, and in, in this small kind of historic period moment of state and nation development, we have seen that we are at least at a point that there is now a consensus on democracy, at least. We no longer have questions that does it work, does it not work, does it suit our context? And now the question is about how do we deepen this democracy? We, we all have a cross board value for it. Uh, we have different solutions for it, um, you know, horizontally uh, stretching it, vertically deepening it. Uh, and, and I think the uh, one thing that has been brought forward the importance of it with all our panelists is the importance of conceding the legitimacy of all political players and learning how better to handle dissent without leading to the kind of polarization that mean, that makes democratic governance almost impossible. And of course, realizing that there are still continuing uh, threats to the idea of democracy, if not to the governance of democracy itself, and that anti-democratic forces do need to kind of understand that this is now on an organic part that reflects people's will and it can no longer be diverted and it's in the well-being of all political uh, players of Pakistan to to work towards trending it so with that thank all of you for being here I um, uh, do uh, wish that we were joined by uh, Sanaullah Baloch Saab and Shafkat Mahmood Saab and and uh, you know questions for them remain maybe at another time but thank you very much for your time and uh, for the office. Good afternoon. Good afternoon.